Oh, you are so soft and fluffy. Okay, I got a, I got a thing to do here, okay? Relax. You might recall a couple of months ago, I made what I call the crisscross dining table. Um, it's held up great, but once it was done, we decided we need a little bit more seating to go with it. So I decided to do a bench that accessorizes it. It's pretty much built the exact same way, just kind of changing proportions and, and size of things as well as the angles. And you can see right here, we've got the same crisscross base. We've got a nice thick top with a raised portion at the back that just kind of gives your butt a bit of a cue to know that you're at the back. I've got kids and a lot of times they're not paying attention. So something like that I think is pretty helpful. And also of course we have that segmented joinery and we have the pillowed legs and rails. So it's a great build. By the way, this is a Wood Whisperer Guild course. If you want the whole thing for the dining table, and the bench, you can get that there at twwguild.com. But for now, enjoy seeing this thing go together. Damn, you got that walnut! I'll use the templates to mark out my stock. And then rough cut the parts with the jigsaw that apparently has a dying battery. Some parts are just easier to break down at the bandsaw. At the jointer, I'll clean up one face and one edge of the legs and rails, and then plane them to final thickness and width. And here's something you don't see many US woodworkers doing, and that's using the planer to establish the width of the board, completely bypassing the table saw. On thicker pieces like this, it's actually a great way to go, assuming your planer doesn't suffer from a lot of snipe. We'll use the templates to shape the legs and cut the angles at the miter saw. For the crisscross, I'll carefully lay out the angles. To make the mortises for the locking spline, I cobbled something together using scraps and one of my spare sacrificial fences. Now it looks wonky, because it is, but it works. And as you can see, my bit is a little bit fried. The mortise on the other side is cut the same way, using the same goofy rig. And now we can work on the joinery. We're gonna use the domino. There's not much to say here since the domino is really just kind of a point and shoot tool, but we're putting two dominoes per joint. And you should use the largest size that you could fit without them getting too close to the outer edges or each other. Now we can cut the legs to their final shape. And finally, my favorite part of the project, pillowing. Next up, we'll put the round over detail on the joint areas. By the way, there are folks who aren't going to like the way that the segmented joint looks, and you should feel free not to do this if you don't like it. On the bench, we're gonna be a little more no frills for attaching the top with screws. I just counterbore deep enough to allow the four inch screw to bite into the top. And then after that counterbore, I can continue to pre-drill a clearance hole all the way through for the screw. That hole is oversized and allows the screw some wiggle room for wood movement. In this course, we'll cover the design and execution of a large dining table and matching bench. This course is a little different than our typical guild courses as the focus is less about the build and more about the design. 
It's something of an experimental design that I wasn't 100% sure would even work. Spoiler alert, it did. But this course will show you my thought process and struggles as I go from design concept into template construction, then into the actual build. We'll then take what we've learned from the table and apply that to a matching bench, and we'll take that opportunity to try some alternative techniques as well. For instance, we'll make the joinery for the table with a router, but we'll use a domino for the bench. So even if you're not looking to build a table exactly like this, there's a lot to learn here in terms of the design and the execution. I hope you'll join me. And now for the glue up. There it is. To clamp the pieces together, I'll use a little miter clamping aid. I actually posted a video recently about how to make them, and if you want to make a set, you want to check that out. It's pretty handy to have around. The splines can then be cut and fit into the mortises. And now the two sub-assemblies can be glued together. It's a good idea to do this glue up on the flattest surface in your shop. The next day, the splines are cleaned up and sanded smooth, and it's time for the seat. I know this looks ridiculous, but my table is out of alignment with the saw, so I was a little bit lazy and didn't fix it. That means I have to do this chopping motion just to prevent the blade from getting pinched. Now if you have stock wide enough, you can make the entire top from one single piece. But I was feeling jolly at the time and decided to make the top in two parts. One lower section as the main part of the seat, and a wider section at the back that features a slight taper angle. The idea being that it's something that not only looks cool, but also tells your butt that you're at the back of the seat. Not that I've ever fallen off of a bench, at least not sober, but I expect people might. Especially if those people are tiny humans that don't pay attention to what they're doing. The two parts are glued up, and in order for this to work, the thinner part of the tapered section should meet perfectly with the back of the flat section. Otherwise, there's going to be a ridge there, and it's going to be real hard to remove after the glue up. And that's actually why I'm using dominoes here, just to keep everything nice and aligned. After some careful sanding, I can move on to the shape of the top. I'm actually reusing the long edge template from the dining table, letting the extra length just hang off the side. Since there's not a lot of material being removed, I just use my router bit for the whole thing. To make the under bevel, we can actually get away with using a router bit for this one. And I'm lucky to have a chamfer bit that has a really high angle, and if I use it on the edge of this top, it makes for a nice shallow under bevel. I tried to look for this exact bit, and I can't seem to find it, but if you look around at chamfer bits, try to find the ones that have odd angles, the ones that are not 45 degrees, you should find something that'll work. Worst case, just use a regular chamfer bit.
Now we just give the whole thing a good thorough sanding and it's time for some finish. Attaching the top to the base is pretty easy. We'll just center up the base and then locate the screws by tapping screws into the holes. I could then remove the base and pre-drill. And then with the base back in place, I can drive the screws. And that's the bench. Nicole was there to give it a little test ride and I think she approves. 